Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asar M. Hotep, with the Madhu Andela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture, as well as the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Kaumba on Friday, August the 5th, 2022. And today's discussion is titled How to Critique the Critique. A response to Dr. Cam Bones and his article on the book, uh, The Origin of the Word Amen. All that and more when we return in just a moment. travels and the like. Uh, I am in Miriam today, uh, PA, and y'all may hear some some background uh, of some children or whatnot uh, later on. Uh, hopefully it won't be too bad, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do these uh, conversations earlier in the day, uh, if live, of course. And just want to shout out everyone who has uh, made themselves known in the chat already. So peace and blessings to Sister Tamika. And B. Dot the God is in the building. And Tony Macaroni is in the building. And uh, we are live as well on Facebook on both the uh, Harold Johnson page as well as on the Asar M Hotel page. And so we're not live right now on uh on Twitter. And so we'll we'll get back on Twitter soon. Uh peace and blessings to Musoni, who's in the building, all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome, welcome to the conversation. And everything is everything. Good to have you in the building. And Tetsi. Ursa Ma'at Ra, Seneferu, is in the building. Uh, thank you for joining. And I'll continue to shout out uh, more people as they make themselves known uh, throughout the chat. And so, you know, as always, uh, a few announcements. I uh, want to shout out uh, Dr. Uh, Chinemalema Mukinge out of the Democratic Republic of Congo of the Baluba people. And our first publication together, uh, Muntu Wan Zombie, A Portrait of Human as God's Special Creation. This is a very informative text uh, dealing with the wisdom tradition and religion of the Baluba people of, of Central Africa. Uh, also in comparison with other African ethnic groups uh, as early as the uh, ancient Egyptians and uh, modern, you know, Wolof and Fulani people and Yoruba people and Amazulu people and the like. And so it's a very encompassing text. And I highly recommend that each of you uh, get the text. And uh, just a reminder, it originally was scheduled for um, like around this time, but I have some additional information that I came across and, you know, had to include it and had to kind of modify uh, certain things in the text. But uh, rest assured, coming soon is Race and Identity 
in ancient Egypt, volume one, towards a meaning for the place name Kemet. So uh, my hopes is to uh, end this discussion on the meaning of the place name Kemet. And so this will be a very comprehensive and detailed text. Uh, it will go beyond the article, which was included in Eluja Volume 2, which came out in 2020. And so, you know, just be prepared. It's, 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 some, it's some good things are going, uh, as, as we would like to say. And uh, I see Brother Any Herod Calfani has made his way into the chat. And so has the pro-Black perspective. Uh in the chat and travel light uh showing rbg love uh welcome to the channel each and every one of you and of course all of you who have not made yourselves known but are quietly uh watching in the background and in about uh five minutes or so uh we should be having our good brother omawali africa uh on the program so we're just going to wait for him to uh come in and he's going to tell us about a film project that he is working on and so you know this is a, a great thing to see uh more of us getting into this space of telling our own stories and including you know activism in our media work and so, you know, Black Media Matters. And so we're going to, he's going to be talking about his, uh, his upcoming film, uh, which he's seeking uh, support. I think it's called From Freedom to Famine. And, you know, when he comes on, I'm going to show a, uh, a brief clip. And... Peace and blessings to Dejed, M. Ankh, Heka Ra. Uh, peace and blessings to the, uh, he says, to the chat and the, uh, the archives and uh, everyone viewing and listening and spying and all of that good stuff. You know, we welcome you all. And so uh, I see our good brother is uh, in the, uh, what I call the green room. So uh, I'm going to introduce him in just a second. And peace to Ty Lackey, Hotep family. Thank you for joining. And so, you know, today's conversation uh, outside of the, the film conversation is going to be, you know, in the series, which I call critiquing, how to critique the critique. And so what I find a lot in this community is that when somebody puts forth an argument uh, or an idea, there's somebody who comes behind uh, them and they give a, a critique of their idea or arguments and people will take the critique as the final say-so in the larger discussion and not understanding that there's dialogue and that, you know, you can critique and that many folks don't know that you can critique the critique. And so this is uh, an ongoing conversation on how to uh, go about examining the critique. And so, you know, we're going to be dealing with a particular text. And before, you know, we do that, make sure that each and every one of you... That is right. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Uh, make sure that you share this conversation on your social media platforms. And uh, we're going to get this thing popping. So uh, before I uh, bring our good brother on, I am going to uh, play the video clip 
of, and let me make that full screen of his trailer. Let me hide that for a second. So uh, hopefully everything um, is good and we will get started now. And that was the trailer. I'm a little upset that that image didn't have Texas um, as belonging to the South, but that's, we're not going to harp, you know, on that. Uh, but a very important topic and just came, I just came back from the South. I, I done made my way back to, to, to Philly. And now you're saying I got to move back to the South uh, to get some land and start farming and stuff. You know, ain't that something. I uh, would like to welcome to the program, Brother Omawali Africa. What's going on? <laughs> all right, hold on. What's going on, brother? Sorry, let me adjust a little bit because I got the camera. I got the camera. Uh, all right. I see. Yeah, I want to make sure that they see you well. We'll do that. We can all do right, that. we good. Uh, the sound right. was on when you played the uh, the clip. There was no sound. There was no sound? Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear anything. It looks like a few folks in the chat didn't hear anything either. Ah, there was no sound. See, this is why um well hopefully we're going to do it again that's you all know, good. So when, that's, we, when we end that's the beauty uh, of doing so i think there is let me make sure so yeah it says to share okay let me do this let me do a little test run so you know it's all about adjusting it's all about adjusting yes sir all right so the question is why why are oh, they so afraid to say that they're doing something um how do we go back? Specifically for you probably just press the back button. Oh, there you go, right there. Let me see. Talk about world hunger as if it is a scourge that all of us want to see abolish. That was the first. Did you hear the sound? Yeah, you good. You good now. You probably just had to click okay. the share audio. Uh, yeah, button. that's that's what I did just now. So we'll, we'll I'll play it again once we 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 end it. It's all so. Little, uh, yeah, because it was full screen, so I couldn't see the chat telling me that there's no sound. So, um, listen, I had, I, I had an interview recently where I had a brother on who was an artist and uh, in the interview, I played one of his tracks and I'm like, I'm like, popping, I'm like going hard and he's sitting there with the still face on. And then it like, he's like, yeah, I didn't hear anything. I was like, damn, uh, <laughs> so I, get yeah. it, I get it. Yeah. So, you know, lesson learned, lesson learned. Um, but you know, welcome to the Mbongi, uh, good brother. And, you know, uh, as you you noted, uh, you introduce yourself in the clip as a documentarian, uh, film documentarian, but you do a little bit more than that. Uh, so can you for those that don't know uh, you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, and, yeah. And what you're uh, called? I appreciate that, brother. So uh, my name is Brother Omawale. I'm a grassroots organizer from the Philadelphia area. Um, I've been organizing since I want to say like my late teens, early 20s, um, started off in the traditional like nine for profit space, uh, working on gun violence in the city. We've had a huge gun violence crisis in Philly for a very a long time. So that's the, that's the space that I kind of cut my teeth in as a grassroots organizer. But um, coming into consciousness, right, and coming into awareness of our situation as a people um, and learning a bit more, I've moved away from the non-for-profit uh, space. And I would say I'm more organically 
uh, grassroots because I understand that the types of organizations and institutions that we need to create to facilitate our liberation and or sovereignty are not going to be non-for-profit like oriented, right? So um, mm-hmm. I think in many ways, those types of structures and NGO structures are, are, are put in place to actually maintain the system rather than to transform it. So having um, grown from where I was when I started in my you know late teens, early uh, 20s to where I am today, you know, I'm, I'm I would say a bona fide just organizer, a people connector, a facilitator, um, an educator. You know, I do political education. I've, I'm a storyteller, so I do use documentaries as the uh, the medium to tell stories, but also to raise, you know, the consciousness of the people. Because, you know, in the words of Dr. Malefe Asante, uh, consciousness precedes unity, right? You know, how you uh, feel about something is based upon what you know about it, right? So if we want people to act in a certain way, we know that thought precedes behavior. So we want to make sure that they have the appropriate inputs, right? Garbage in, garbage out. We want we want the appropriate inputs so that they can have the appropriate actions, so to speak. So that's, that's me in a nutshell, bro. I'm an educator. I'm a storyteller. I'm a connector. I'm an organizer. I, I do uh, whatever is necessary to aid in the liberation of our people respect respect so um tell us about the project uh under discussion and then kind of lead into how you came about and decided you know what a a film needs to be done and we need to inform uh more of us you know about this this movement and and why yeah. Go ahead. So the project that we're currently working on is called Hannibal, the fight for food sovereignty in the South. Um, and the word or the name Hannibal uh, and the title is in reference to uh, Baba Hannibal Tyrus of Freak. Um, he's an elder, an ancestor, a Baba, a warrior um, within our community. Um, one of the most serious and committed uh, generals that black America has ever seen, but also one of the least known. Um, I would argue that in many ways throughout the 20th century, he operated like a 20th slash 21st century maroon. So in that regard, he's done um, significant work across the domains of culture, education, uh, food sovereignty, survivalism, protection, um, and work that I feel in this particular moment needs to be uh, raised up and reactivated for our present generation. So uh, a, a big part of this project is introducing uh, the community to Baba Hannibal Tyrus of Freak, you know, especially this generation, um, but more importantly, reactivating the work that he dedicated his life to. You know, Baba Hannibal transitioned back, uh, I believe, June 27, 2011, and he was a lifelong uh, warrior. You know, if you uh, listen to folks like Mama Marimba Ani, you know, she refers to him as her her general. Uh, if you listen to folks like uh, uh, Walimu Baruti, uh, <laughs> baby, you got to go upstairs. You know, if you listen to folks. OK, do me a favor, Mama, and you go upstairs. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm on a call right now. All right. Pardon y'all. Pardon, if y'all see, I got the you know, y'all can't see, but my little. A four-year-old just popped up right over there on the side of me in the studio. But yeah, folks like uh, Bob Baruti refers to him as, you know, as his warrior Jegna. So what we're trying to do with this project is really um, raise awareness, raise consciousness related to the land issue that we as African people are facing here in the U.S. Um, but it's an issue that it's, it's really a pan-African issue because, it, you know, the land issue is something that all you know black people are 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 facing we're all facing a land crisis we're all facing a culture crisis uh we're all facing a food crisis right we're all facing a a crisis of power right so um and this day and age with the issues that we see the food shortages that we see the globalist policies in terms of how they're going to impact african people wherever we are I think that we need an intelligent, an intelligent response. And, um, you know, we've had intelligent generals who've laid out some excellent black prints that should be uh, reexamined in, in this day. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't even know that these people exist or that their black prints exist. So the documentary in many ways helps us to um, bring it back to life. Indeed. And I just want to kind of highlight a 
a book that I have that I've been, you know, uh, promoting, uh, even though it's not necessarily worded in the uh, in in the language of RBG, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, it's a it's a text called "Rooted in the Earth." reclaiming the african-american environmental heritage mm. and you know it part of that conversation is by uh sister deanna d uh clave or glade yeah um and you know it's it, it's a one way or another you you find it more and more of us having this conversation of of getting back to land ownership, getting back to farming and having an environmental uh, consciousness in the the process. And so uh, I wanted to, you know, kind of put this discussion in that in that same kind of framework that, you know, like it, it's very important, like it's a very serious thing, what you're talking about. And yeah. like we even though it's not necessarily uh, farmland, uh, we we hear about this uh, the story about how the land was taken from a family in California, a beach, yeah, yeah, and yep, how yep. the the descendants are just getting it back now, yeah, and uh, so this you know it's part of a larger conversation, and I like how you introduce it in the context of power, and 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 rooting that in rooting the conversation in power and and so when we say food sovereignty you know it, it's it's on one hand you know beyond a simple discussion of simply growing your own food and having you know healthy varieties but it's also kind of a, a discussion about war and when you know your enemy has the power to cut off your food supply what kind of position is this, uh, uh, that put you through or put you in and what kind of compromises are you willing to accept as a result of being in that position of powerlessness? Bro, I so appreciate you raising that because, you know, you know, it's so unfortunate because so many of us are trapped in survival mode that we oftentimes don't have the time and the space to think about those larger implications that you are raising. You know, if, if all of us were, you know, Asar Imhotep, then a lot of us would be thinking like this. But the fact is, the our family, you know, a lot of us are not. So the ro the purpose of a documentary project like this is to, our, our people are oral people. You know, I could write a paper, I could write a book and talk to them about, you know, the sovereignty issue. But we know the art of storytelling is something that captivates and intrigues. And if you can tell it to them in a way that really activates, you know, that light center and the mind in the way that you just stated in a very simple fashion, you know, a, a, a documentary project becomes a way to spread that level of consciousness and awareness across a population of people and get them to act in a very real way. And, and that's really what we're hoping to achieve with this project. Like ultimately, if you eat food, right? If you depend on food for your survival, which we all do, then you, you have a hand to play, you know, in the food sovereignty movement. And at the end of the day, it, it, there's deeper discussions that have to occur here because you can't have food sovereignty without land sovereignty. And then that, it makes you deal with the issue of like within the US in particular, we know about the 40 acres and the mule, right? The promise that, you know, they, they, they took that back from us. But more importantly, post-emancipation, you know, our ancestors between the years of 1865 and 2020 had acquired roughly 16 million acres of land, right? They own land in proportion to our population, right? So by 20, I'm sorry, by 1920, I think I said 2020 at first, by 1920, uh, we had owned 14% of the land. Whereas though in 2020, right, the last study that was done, we own less than a half a percent, right? So we lost the equivalent of nearly $350 billion in land, you know, over a 100-year period. 
And with the global food crisis, with the farming crisis that we see playing out with the racist policies like of the USDA and how black farmers are losing their land to debt uh, and to, you know, some very underhanded and racist policies that are put in place. Like this is a fight that we all need to be deeply invested in. And as you know, from, you know, any uh, what they refer to as asymmetrical warfare or guerrilla warfare, like the, the first phase is always consciousness raising. And a lot of us, you know, people are like, you know, why are you doing a documentary like in the middle of a crisis? And I'm like, well, don't you want people to be able to act? Like, why is it that our enemy spends tr billions of dollars on propaganda? And we're just trying to raise, you know, a, a, a little measly 70K for a propaganda effort. Propaganda is meant to shape your behavior, right? So if you don't see the importance of investing and propaganda or investing and in storytelling so that you can activate the consciousness of your people, then maybe we don't see things the same, but also we have other things and plan as well, but like, we're not going to tell you everything that we are trying to do like on the front end. You know what I mean? Like this, like, as you mentioned, this is war. So therefore strategy and tactics are important. So to the family who has supported the project, to the family who's donated and, and, and has given to the project, we, uh, are deeply uh, grateful for the support that you all have given, and we hope that you all will continue to support to help us get this thing across the finish line. Yes, and I, and I hope I have the uh, the link correct. Yeah. So uh, the so the campaign, the Indiegogo, was only available for sixty days. Okay. Um, we raised 10% of what we were trying to raise via Indiegogo. Um, so they'll still give us that, um, they'll, they'll still issue us that. But if you want to support now, I mean, you can use that link to go and read about the campaign, but if you'd like to give, like you can send via cash app. Um, the cash app is dollar sign strike drum. And if you, what I would ask you to you do say is, that again, it's strike. dollar sign strike drum, like strike the drum. Okay. Like the war drum strike drum. Um, but what I would ask family to do is um, we still honor the perks from the campaign. So if you go to the uh, campaign page, I mean, if you'd like, you can just give a regular contribution. But if you want one of the perks associated with the campaign, um, just when you uh, send via cash app, just put uh, like the word perk along with the amount that you're giving. Right. So the perks are listed there. There's a. $19 Juneteenth contribution. There's a $25 video tri tribute. There's a $50 video tribute and DVD. So all you got to do is put the word perk and the amount that you're giving. And um, I'll, I'll um, I just need your email as well. So once you give the cash app, you can email me at info at omawaliafrica.com um, just to make sure that we, we have you and, and we're good. So you got to click on about this campaign because they closed it. So you click on about <laughs> There you go. See it at the top? Yeah. Right under yep. And after you click on the about, you scroll down and there's a um, click on continue they... reading. If you click on continue reading at the okay, bottom. Okay, there you go. Yeah. That's no, because the they perks. archived it. And then so you see the perks right there on the side. So if you want to if you want to give at one of those perk levels, uh, just when you give via Cash App, um, all that I would ask uh, you to do is after you give, just send me an email at info at omawaliafrica.com. And my email is also associated with the campaign um, just to let me know that you sent the cash app. And we'll make sure that, you know, you're accounted for as well with the perks. Already, already. And so that's the the link on the page uh, to to view all of the details of the film and fundraising. You can still see the trailer there. Yep. And uh, let me go back to that. There we go. And this is the and make sure I'm spelling this correctly. Yep. Uh, strike drum. Cash uh, this is the, the, the cash app uh, because the campaign. And so uh, we had hoped to get them on a little earlier. Uh, yeah. This no, week, it's no, schedules, no, there's no worries uh, at all, bro. Like uh, like like I said, this is, you know, this is going to be an ongoing effort. And, it, you know, it is what it is. That's what production work is like. Unless you got big George Soros budgets, like, you know, you Indeed. as a grassroots worker, you know, you learn to do things in phases. Right. You learn to live off the yeah. land, you know, so to speak. So we're going to get the project done. So, you know, all the support that's coming in, like we're deeply uh, appreciative of support that we've been given so far and collectively. Right. We're going to get this thing done. Indeed. And before we go, uh, let us know 
uh, first and foremost, your own uh, podcast and video podcast and what you got coming on, uh, coming through and, and how can they uh, find you? Yeah, so I'm everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at OmowaliAfrica.com. I'm sorry, at Omowale Africa. Um, my website is OmowaleAfrica.com. And I have a live show called Black of Duty with Omowale every Sunday at 8. That's on my YouTube. So just search Omowale Africa on YouTube and subscribe. And then every Friday at 5 p.m., we release a pre recorded interview called Going Off Topic with Omowale. Um, today's guest is Brother Onkaku. Um, he's into comedic yoga, um, but he also talks about um, marketing as spiritual warfare. So we have a really good conversation dropping with him tonight. Uh, at five o'clock. So, uh, you know, brother, sorry, man, I appreciate you uh, uh, giving, giving us the platform and, you know, I support, you know, your work and everything you got going on, bro. For real. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. And for those of us uh, who just joined uh, the, the program, this is brother Omarali Africa and uh, check the archive for the, uh, for the links. And I'm going to put them in the description uh, for the people who are checking the archives. And uh, we appreciate it and look forward uh, to the film and uh, being a part of that process, and I'll be donating soon. Appreciate so, you. Uh, thank you uh, for for joining the conversation, and uh, check out that show at five. So All hopefully right. we'll be done by then. All right, peace. Uh, Talk to you peace. All right. All righty, I say. And um, so that was our good brother on Wally. Wanted to uh, give him some time to uh, promote the film again. You know, we originally scheduled for this this past Wednesday, uh, but uh, uh, something came up, and so we had to reschedule, and I wanted to uh, get him on, so probably, you know, uh, have him on just on on some other uh, topics uh, as well, so I just want to kind of go through real quick and uh, shout out uh, a few people I don't think that I've shouted out already, so uh, peace to T. Savior and African Renaissance TV and that good guy and Ernest Godfrey uh, in the building, piece of Donnie Williams in the African world. Uh, let me see, LA, Oklahoma is in the building. Peace and blessings to you. Uh, I'm not sure if I shouted out the pro-black perspective, but if I did already, well, you get two shout outs. So uh, today is your special day. Uh, welcome to the Mbongi. Uh, each and every one of you, and and peace of sister Emmy Cat, who's in the building. Thank you for joining. And everything is everything. Um, shout out to each and every one of you. Thank you all for joining. And so, without further ado, I'm gonna get to the topic at hand. And so, today's discussion, as mentioned earlier, is titled "How to Critique." The Critique, a response to Dr. Cam Bone, sub-subtitled, a look at his critique of Drs. Osei, Faraji, and Issa's book on the God Amen. So it is about to go down. And so what I'm going to do now is share my screen. And so keep in mind that when I have my, my screen shared, I will not be able to see any comments. Uh, so, you know, please forgive me. I guess I could pull out my phone and, you know, to kind of uh, check the temperature. And, oh, and I forgot to play his uh, his video. So I'm going to make sure I do that by the end of the show so y'all can actually hear the audio. And so I do apologize uh, for that. So we're going to share the screen right now. And I'm going to do a full screen. So, boom. And let's hide that. And we're going to do it from the beginning. So, let me pull up uh, YouTube on my phone. And there we go. So, oh, it doesn't look like. Oh, let me just make sure that the screen is being shared. And all is to the good. So we're about to get it in. All righty. So although the name of the show is How to Critique the Critique, the title of the presentation is Where There is Smoke, There is Fire. So, uh, you know, 
hopefully that will be made clear uh, by the the end of this discussion. So <laughs> the uh, again the the central uh, text for which this conversation is uh, responsible for is titled The Origin of the Word Amen. Ancient Knowledge the Bible Has Never Told by, is written by Professor Kwame Ose, uh, Drs. Jahi Issa and Selene Faraji. And uh, you can see their images on the screen, uh, hopefully. And so I think, so here's a little background of the text. So the text is actually a pamphlet that was a little booklet that was written by Professor Okwami Osei, who you see at the top right there. So he is the main author of the text. Uh, both Dr. Faraji and Dr. Issa, uh, I think Dr. Faraji is currently married to, and Dr. Jahi Issa used to be married to, uh women from ghana and so i think on one of their family trips to ghana they came across uh either both of them or one of them came across the pamphlet written by kwame ose uh by that same title and after contacting them i want to say this was like in 1998 uh, or 1999 and they got to talking and they asked Professor uh, Osei if they can publish the book uh, here in the United States and if they can add their own uh, chapters and additions you know without changing the uh, the the fundamental, the core text. And so all of this is important to the critique of the critique because uh, this was not mentioned in the critique at all. And, it, and it's very important to the discourse. So I think it was in the year 2000 or 2001 that they published the, they joint published the, the text, the origin of the word Amen. Ancient knowledge, the Bible has never told. And so what Dr. Faraji and Dr. Issa did was they added on to the conversation in the, the realm of uh, archaeology and history. And the primary conversation uh, still is Professor Ose. So this version of the text that you're seeing right here on the left-hand side is actually the second edition and I have the first edition. I do not have the second edition of the text. And what ended up happening is, and I think this came out in 2020, the second edition of this text. So in comes Dr. Obadeli Cambon. Now, <laughs> Obadeli Cambon is a professor uh, of linguistics at the University of Ghana. He's originally from the United States. Uh, he repatriated to Ghana. I don't know what year, uh, but he's been there for a while. And so he's also a research fellow in the language, literature, and drama section of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. He is also currently the editor in chief of the Ghana Journal of Linguistics and Secretary of the African Studies Association of Africa. So uh, this is important information because the critique was placed in the Ghana Journal of Linguistics for which he is the editor of that journal. And so from my understanding of the events, 
Dr. Cambon and Drs. Faraji and Issa, uh, they they are familiar with each other and 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 had a you know kind of working relationship. They have been to Ghana, they have lectured in his classes. Uh, Issa has published an article of his in the Journal of Pan-African Studies. So he's not new to them and they are not new to him. And so from my understanding, when they were in Ghana in 2020, they gave Dr. Cambon a copy of the book and asked them for a critique and to make suggestions on how to de- improve the book on the linguistic front. And this was allegedly like in the beginning of spring of that year of 2020. And to my knowledge and understanding, Professor Cambon accepted the text. However, he did not um, correspond with them uh, or had little correspondence and and did not give the requested feedback about the text to the authors. Instead, he writes his critique, which is titled an editorial book critique, the origin of the word Amen. Uh, Several months later, and I think it was like in the, the fall going into winter that the text comes out. So, uh, again, to my knowledge, Dr. Issa and Dr. Faraji did not hear back from him. And they had to find out about his um, his feelings about the text through this article that was written about their text. Right. So, again, it is titled an editorial book critique, because remember, he's the the chief, the editor in chief of the, um, you know, Ghanaian Journal of Linguistics. Right. So this is the editor giving a book critique of the text, the origin of the word Amen. Uh, This text here, the second edition, ancient knowledge, the Bible has never told. And so, <laughs> so before we get started, again, this is a, a conversation on how to critique the critique. And the, and although this text was written in 2020, uh, this, this critique here, um, Doctors Faraji and Issa wrote a response to the critique. And and now I'm having a conversation since they have now responded to uh, Dr. Cambon concerning their text. Now, (laughs) this isn't a situation where, you know, I'm trying to condemn Cambon or or say that he is wrong because on the linguistic issue that is regarding the text i actually agree with cambon and you know a little bit of history here this is how i met dr faraji i purchased the book the the first edition way back in the, the mid to late 2000s And after reading the text, I sent, because there's a website, The Origin of the Word Amen, for where you can purchase the book. And I ordered from there. And I got in contact with Dr. Faraji and, you know, uh, introduced myself. And I told him that, you know, for the second edition, I would suggest that you you have a linguist look over it because certain arguments that you are making 
uh, a, a linguist would definitely have an issue with your your arguments. And so this is how I was introduced to Dr. Faraji. I sent him an email making some of the same arguments that Dr. Cambone has made in his critique. And so remember that the title of the book is The Origin of the Word, the Word Amen. And when you when you title the book this way, it becomes a linguistic argument. And so uh, uh, an individual like Dr. Obadele Cambone, you know, would would look at this and they would approach this from a linguistic standpoint. And so, you know, I'm just reminding the audience on the, the, the fundamental linguistic issues that are apparent in the text. Again, I don't have the second edition, but it doesn't look like my advice from the, the mid uh, to late 2000s was taken in terms of having a linguist look at it uh, prior to publishing. So what Dr. Faraji and Dr. Issa did is that they gave Cambone the text after they have already published the second edition. And in my opinion, they should have given it to him or another linguist or a series of linguists prior to the publication of the book itself. And in that way, you know, the linguistic issues could have been worked out and they would have had a more solid treatment uh of the question and so the 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 text again is is essentially uh making the the argument that the the bible got the text excuse me got the word amen itself from you know africans uh more specifically the ancient egyptians and that you you find the uh sorry for the noise i don't know if y'all can hear it in the background but the that Amun can also be found in West Africa among the Akan people for which Dr. Okwami Ose is a member and native speaker of the Akan uh, language. So this is, you know, hopefully I've given an, uh, enough background to give a, you know, to, to frame this. Uh, in context right so but there are some there are some issues that I have with the critique itself and so you know here are a few and most which will I will I will address in the actual uh, conversation so let me Let's see there we go and you know the first is the overall tone of the the article and it is it is very much you know written in a way as if dr cambone is not speaking with colleagues like he doesn't know them like he doesn't have a relationship with them and it is it is very condescending in terms of the 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 language and the tone of the article right and you know so this is why it was important for me to 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 bring that background that they know each other and to my knowledge he did not correspond with them and to give them feedback he instead he goes to the editorial uh, excuse me, he uses his position in a, the, the Ghana Journal of Linguistics to uh, give his opinion about the text. So, you know, this kind of rubs me the wrong way and doesn't seem professional in my opinion, uh, given their history and, and background. So uh, it's written on here third, but uh, the first two are kind of go together. But he appeals to authority a lot and you know when we're critiquing the critique you know that i i always one of the things i you know advocate for is to look at when somebody has actually demonstrated something 
versus when they appeal to authority. And a lot of folks like to appeal to authority when they don't have the the information to invalidate an argument. And that's real prevalent in this community is is the appealing to authority. And the overall academic usefulness is very low, in my opinion, of the text. Why do I say that? Because the, the text is 21 pages long. And so the essential fundamental tone and spirit of the article is that at the end of the day, uh, professors Kwase, uh, Kwame Ose and Faraji and Issa are wrong on the subject um, for various different reasons. But what he doesn't do is correct them or show the reader how it is done. And so when you don't show the person or the reader how it is done, then we're we left as the reader, left as the layperson, we, 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 uh, we're still left with the the question, well, well, how is it supposed to be done? Where do I go to see it being done correctly? How will I know that it's being done correctly? You don't you don't get that sense in the text because he doesn't demonstrate that in the text. He doesn't show them. And so and this is because and this is the last point here that. Cambone is not in conversation with the uh, with the authors of the text It's it's not like he is is is. You know, trying to teach them how to improve. It's like it's more so it's like he's at a it, the, the overall tone of the text is like he's at a barbershop and he's just shooting the ish with some friends uh, and on on how he don't like so and so and how this text is bullshit, basically. Right. It's, it's he's not having a conversation with with Professor Kwame Ose or Salim Faraji or Jahi Issa. It's not in the tone of a dialogue. And because of that, that's why he doesn't, you know, it's just it just comes off as just complaining or or like a, a woman venting about her day at the job. That's the kind of spirit and sense that I get from the text. Again, the the fundamental linguistic arguments made by Cambone are 100 percent correct. And I had the same uh, arguments for them way back, you know, in, I don't know, was it 2007, eight or whatever uh, year that I, that I actually purchased the text. So it's not an issue that Cambone is wrong on that point. He, he's right on the linguistic point. It's, it's just other areas that, if if somebody just reading it would just look at it and say, well, you know, that's the end of that. And and as we know, in this uh, in this community, in this space, you know, we we stop and say, well, let, let's look a little closer at this, this and this. And uh, so that's exactly what we're doing today. So I have fundamentally three critiques that we are going to deal with today. And I will try to get uh, through with these. Uh, as quickly as possible. So the first critique is, of course, the appealing to authority. And <laughs> on page 74 of Cambone's uh, editorial critique of the book, he states the following, and I have for emphasis kind of highlighted here uh, something which I'll come back to and, and address. So in this section of the editorial book critique, this is Cambone speaking, I will discuss the author's ideas and the book's thesis within a scholarly perspective. This will serve as a critical assessment of the book within the larger scholarly discourse. Firstly, and most strikingly, the authors seem to be wholly unaware of the work of Tata, uh, word meaning father or elder, 
Theophile Benga, who has already made comparisons between Amin and contemporary African languages. And then he gives the source, Obinga 1993. In fact, the authors do not critique, draw from, or even refer to this work. There is a thin line between actually doing groundbreaking research on the one hand and simply failing to do even a cursory review of relevant literature. This is particularly unfortunate as a review of the works of those who actually have formal training in linguistics, such as Tata Obinga, would certainly help the author's cause in the area of credibility. Further, it would also help in terms of understanding that historical linguistics as a highly technical subfield requires a methodology beyond what seems to amount to making a surface observation that one may happen to look like another word in an entirely different language, or that any word that has an M and an N in it should be given a convincing backstory that ties it to the word Amen uh, somehow. So there's a lot to unpack here. And so let's go through it. So what I have highlighted here is that what he does is an appeal to authority logical fallacy here, right? He says, firstly, and most strikingly, the authors seem to be wholly unaware of the work of Tata Theophilo Benga, who has already made comparisons between Amin and contemporary African languages. That may be the case. Um, but if you are going to suggest that they know of a particular somebody in a particular text, it would be uh, helpful if the, the author actually does what you say they did in the text. And you can see here that he even words it in a way that um, oh, uh, Dr. Obinga would certainly help the author's cause in the area of credibility. In other words, you know, if, if his name is associated with it, then, you know, your work would be more credible. Right. And he also mentioned something in here that, you know, you would have to kind of uh, be familiar with historical comparative linguistics. And that is what, what he's accusing the authors of the, the Amen book of doing is simply finding words in various African languages and more so amongst the Akan tree language of having the sequence M and N, as we can see in the word Amen. So if, if the word has M and N in it, then uh, he's, he's accusing the authors of saying that these words are uh, associated with the word Amen. And that, you know, and so this is a fundamental methodological issue that we try to avoid in historical comparative linguistics, which is why the, you know, demonstrating a series of, of regular non-accidental sound meaning correspondences is essential in terms of the methodology of establishing, you know, uh, or making the argument that two or more words within a language are actual cognates, meaning that they are inherited from a pre, uh, pre-dialectical parent language and that these terms were in fact inherited in these dialects that became languages, you know, over time as the population began to increase and spread in terms of distance and time, right? So keep all of that in mind when, you know, uh, as, as we move forward. So this is the 1993 text from which Cambone is referring to. And of course, this is uh, Dr. Theophile Benga on the right hand side. And he's also one of the the editors and founders of the uh, Unk Journal, which you can kind of see over here uh, on the left hand side. And so the 1993 text is the uh, the common origin of ancient Egyptian, Coptic and modern Negro uh, African languages, an introduction to African historical linguistics, right? So that's the 
translation of this text. So when so remember, he said so he's accusing them of not knowing. I don't know if he's including not knowing of Dr. Phil Falobinga, but certainly that they are unaware of Obinga's 1993 work, because in this Cambone alleges that uh, Obinga actually does uh, an, an analysis and comparison of African uh, languages and and in association with the god Amen. And I'm here to tell you that that is false. He does not do that in the text, not in a systematic way. And a matter of fact, the the what he's trying to accuse uh, Ose and Faraji and Issa of in terms of just finding an MN consonant sequence and associating with Amen, that's exactly what Theophilo Binga does in this text. There is no systematic, no etymological uh, analysis you know getting to the core of what the what the word amen means uh or anything in the text he doesn't do that's not his con his care and concern in this text and so it's i'm i'm scratching my head trying to figure out why would you even suggest this book why didn't you suggest for example dr mubai being a bololo um who actually wrote a text on the god Amen. And the entire text is an, an analysis and some experimental work, uh, linguistic experimental work, trying to get at the origin of the god, uh, of the word and the god Amen. And so it's the invisibility and imminence of the creator Amen. Uh, how should I say? Example of the vitality of. Uh, the pharaonic uh, philosophical discourse of Chiena Intu. And, you know, Chiena Intu is the name of the, the language family, you know, that he argues uh, ancient Egyptian belongs to. So, right, so here, here's an entire text published in, in 2010 of, you know, an, an, an African... Uh, of the same caliber uh, and in prominence as uh, Obinga in, in the Francophone world, who has done an entire text on Amen, but this isn't the recommendation. Uh, he recommends Obinga 1993. And this is, you know, like you're not going to find a systematic analysis of the MN consonant sequence you're going to find stuff like this. So this is, you know, page 282. So I have the text. And so you, in this section here, Obinga is comparing, you know, words to, uh, excuse me, the names of deities in ancient Egypt to modern African languages and the like, and or making suggestions of, of common reflexes. So on page 282 at the very top, you have Amen, you know, the God Amen here, right? And then he makes a suggestion of the God Imana, uh, the great God, the great God of the uh, Great Lakes uh, region of Central Africa, Rwanda, Burundi, etc. Right. So there is a, a a name Imana. It's the name of uh, the deity. And it looks and it sounds like Amen of the ancient uh, of ancient Egypt, and so Obinga makes a connection here. And this is not how you do this in linguistics. The very thing that Cambon is accusing Ose, Faraji, and uh, Issa, and it's really Professor Kwame Ose, because remember. The first part of the book, the person who's making the linguistic arguments is, in fact, Kwame Ose, who um, allegedly has a, a background in linguistics. But it may, you know, there's many different fields. It's clear that he doesn't have a background in historical comparative linguistics. He 
you know, it may be in literature, it may be in in something else. And, you know, that I'm not familiar with at the moment. I'm talking about Professor Kwame Okwame Ose. So, you know, you, you would not give this as an example on how to correctly do the work as Cambone argued in the text. And so, you know, when you go to like pages 128 through 129, you have this text here, which I have for the French, so that when you come back, you can pause it and, uh, you know, read it for yourself if you read the French, but I have given my cursory translation here. And so in this section of the text, uh, Obinga is discussing certain grammatical features in Black African languages that are shared with ancient Egyptian. And so he's talking about this so-called Nesby I or Y at the end of, of words. So this is starting on page um, 120, I believe he's he's finishing a conversation that that or he's continuing a conversation that begins on the, the, the previous page. So if this uh, sentence seems out of place, that's why. So he says, determination is always E or Y. Such a detail, phonetic and morphological at the same time, constitutes a peculiarity too significant to be neglected. So here's the key thing that we're uh, looking at here. If, and I have bolded and read it, the word if in this sentence. <laughs> and it says, if, on the other hand, the name Amen means the seer, the great God, because he dominates everything with his sight because of his pr properly panoramic gaze, then it is clear that this word has been preserved as it is in Mbochi. Mbochi is Dr. Obinga's native language. And in many other Negro African languages, which have the forms Amani, Imana, etc. In Mbochi, Omani is in fact the one who sees as with eyes other than human eyes, the idea of transcendence, right? And so this, this paragraph is very telling because, again, he's not doing a linguistic analysis. He's, he's hypothesizing right now. He's guessing. That's why he says, if, on the other hand, the name Amen means the seer. So he doesn't know what the name Amen means. So he's not really trying to, he's not uh, serious in trying to find out either. Again, this section has to deal with something totally different. That's not his concern in this text. He's not doing etymological work, you know, which will require a whole process. But as you can see here, he's not doing any deep uh, systematic comparisons and, you know, with other African languages. You have this one suggestion on this page with uh, Rwanda and Burundi, the, the name of God, Imana. And this is chance lookalike. There's, there's, no, there's no establishing sound laws and, and any of that. And even when you go through the book, you won't see it. And even here, he's making a suggestion. Well, maybe the name Amen means the one who sees, the seer. Because it, it this... Matter of fact, it sounds like and looks like the word Omani in, in my language in Bochi, which means the one who sees as with eyes other than human eyes. This is this is hypothetical stuff here. This isn't a comparison, a, a systematic comparison that a that a linguist would do to try to get at uh you know establishing that you know the 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 word Amen is present in their language. Again, I'm scratching my head trying to figure out why would you suggest Obinga's work in trying to criticize Ose, Isa, and Faraji for not knowing about the work when the work itself doesn't even do the work in which you're suggesting. So what was they supposed to learn about this uh, in relation to uh, you know, their overall thesis if Obinga is not doing the work in which you suggest he's doing. And so we have this one example here of the consonant sequence MN for which 
you know, which means to to stay or to remain, and this is it in the center uh, in the Coptic language, and that he's doing some comparisons with Mbochi, uh, meaning that uh, with the word mana, that which is fixed only, you know, and this is his only example of the MN consonant sequence, which he's doing comparisons. So we have this one word here in Kikongo and Bambara, Mene, and you know and then imana you know to 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 remain stable firm etc but this isn't remember he's not arguing that this is the root of the word amen of the name of the god amen this is just a a a homograph of the consonant sequence mn in the ancient egyptian language there's no work done here and even this variation you know, outside of the the uh, the embochi, this would not be accepted as uh, acceptable in terms of making an argument for uh, the the cognates, you know, being in the language. And so, again, we're we're left with, you know, wondering what what why even what was the point in bringing obinga up in the article when he doesn't do that work in this text and so you know i have to go beyond that text to see if there's any 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 really kind of work done on the god amen uh you know done by obinga so i go into his african philosophy book the pharaonic period 2780 to 33 uh or 330 uh bc right and so you know he even makes a uh he he continues this conversation about amen and so he says in this account ama so ama is the the dogon deity the deity was known in the Nile Valley as Amen, Amen Ra, and in Rwanda as Imani. The name retains the identical consonant structure MN, created the spirit Nomo, master of water. You see what he's doing here? And for those of you who have the text, uh, Obinga's text, you can go to page 543, go to the page before, and go to the page after. You will not see a linguistic demonstration that says that Ama is cognate with um amen or that uh imana is cognate with ama where where is obinga getting this from where is the demonstration of this fact he doesn't reference another work in which he does it so we're left to to guess and so on page 542 we continue the Rwanda and Rundi people of the African Great Lakes region, as well as the Sangha people of the Shaba province in Congo, call God by the same name, Imana. This is a self-made God, a powerful creator divinity. The word Imana evokes the ancient Egyptian name Amen. This is the same method that Osei did in the origin of the word Amen text. This is this is what we call a sound lookalike because Imana looks like the word Amen written in the hieroglyphs in the Latin languages. They they're connected. So we at least have two texts that have been cited where he has made this argument. And in this text, he adds a third deity by the name of Ama among the Dogon. So this is. uh this is why it's important to go back and follow up on the critiques and to go get those texts to see if the critique is warranted. Again, the essential nature of Cambon's linguistic arguments against Kwame Ose, Salim Faraji, and Jahi Issa are legit. And matter of fact, I spoke to uh, Dr. Uh, Faraji and dr isa after they released their response to dr cambone and when i talked to them i told them that 
Cambone's linguistic arguments still stand. And that even in your response, you alluded to some linguistic arguments for which when Cambone responds to their response, he's he's still going to bring up those issues that were brought up in the first critique. Because, you you know, uh, and so they, they don't seem to kind of understand why why the linguistic part is very important, because the title of the book is the origin of the word Amen. You have invoked, you have brought to the surface linguistics as a field of study. And there are just certain arguments that you just have to understand uh you know in the field to make but you don't come and suggest a text that is doing the exact same thing and providing and using the exact same methodologies to make his arguments obinga in this case is finding words that look like the word amen and may it may uh, that is associated with deity and saying that that they are related and that they are the same without any kind of demonstration whatsoever. And it's going to be like this no matter what text that you find from Obinga. And I have several of Obinga's texts and it's the same thing. Right. And so even when you look at the the word Imana in, for example, in Kirundi, you know, you have in the dictionaries Ubumana, which means godliness, and of course, Imana, which is God. But the root of Imana is Mana and Kumana. Ku is the infinitive uh, verb prefix, right? And what you have in parentheses is the uh, kind of uh, class, uh, plural, and and in in the in the case of uh imani so the plural is still e and then i think this is a uh suffix in the case of this verb here in kumana that nye that you see in the parentheses but the root of the word imana means to be together to be a neighbor to be a pair right and so if if Obinga is suggesting that, you know, uh, the god Amen de derives from a root meaning to uh, to see and to the seer. This is a far cry from to be together, to be the neighbor, to be a pair. You know, even if you subscribe to the standard interpretation of Amen being the hidden god, because there's a root. Amen or men meaning to hide or to be hidden. This would be a far semantic cry from uh, the the suggestions as as evident from the language of Kirundi and the like. But we're going to come back to this because this is going to this is still very informative and it, it still relates to you know, uh, the, the God Amen. And so, you know, Obinga can be right for all the wrong reasons. And it's the same thing with doctors Ose and Faraji and, uh, and Issa, right? They, what I'm arguing is that they're fundamentally correct, but for the wrong reasons, you know, they, they, their methodology does not demonstrate that they are correct. It's a lucky guess. And so, and, and what I'm arguing here is that Obinga, outside of his the seer hypothesis, is fundamentally correct, but he's 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 right for the wrong reasons. His methodology would not get him there on this particular question, right? And note that is it's really in money. But there's a rule in the Burundi language that the the in the I N prefix. When the N is followed by an M. 
the 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 nasalized bilabial uh the n disappears so that's why you say e money instead of in money so you would have to account for that in the relations between um ancient egyptian and uh kirundi for example so we'll continue so <laughs> Uh, appealing to authority part two. So the, the first part, you know, uh, I hope I was clear on, on the issue in the first part. So, you know, if you're going to appeal to authority, make sure that they're actually doing what you're suggesting. So this it's notice, let's go back to the actual post by Cambon. Notice he doesn't give a page number. He just says Obinga 1993. So we're supposed to read the whole book to find out where he discusses Amen. And that's because, you know, he couldn't put a page number because there was no place in the 1993 book where he does a systematic analysis where he demonstrates and proves the, the relationship between Amen and Black African languages. That wasn't his focus. So now we're going to part two of our critique. And so there's there's parts of the text. There's a whole section of the text of the editorial um, book critique made by Professor uh, Obadeli Cambon, where he questions the uh, the training of doctors Faraji and uh, and uh, Dr. Issa and, you know, talking about, you know, like they don't have any like linguistic training and stuff like this. And, you know, he's going to their websites and reading off their biographies, which is, which is strange because the, you know, they put their biographies and their histories in the actual, the origin of the uh, word Amen book and never do they claim not once that they are linguist. It is the in fact the, the exact opposite. They're, they're, they put their biographies in the text to show you, you know, what their contributions are to the text. That's why it's important to understand the makeup of the origin of the word Amen text. Okwami Ose wrote the pamphlet. He's the one making the linguistic argument. Faraji and Issa are bringing the, the background of history and archaeology to the conversation. And their conversation is centered around those areas and talking about Kush and possible travel, you know, um, the, the yellow now and migrations and stuff like that. That's their argument in the text. And, and I believe that they kind of reemphasize that in their response to Campbell. But and so there's a lot of wasted energy in the text, you know, talking about them not being linguists when they never claimed to be linguists in the first place. And, and I don't know if Campbell really realizes or or if he just ignored it and chose not to inform the reader that he knows that the the linguistic arguments is Kwame Ose, and then the other aspects of the book is uh, Faraji and Issa. And so if you didn't have that background, you're just reading the critique, you know, you, you would think that, you know, all three of them got together and made a linguistic argument and, and published the text, and that's not the case. You know, Faraji and... Uh, and, and Issa do not claim to be linguist or have any linguistic training. And this was this was explicitly stated in the text. And so it's, you know, and, you know, and Cambone has this habit just in other experiences of trying to sun people who don't have PhDs or masters or whatnot in linguistics, right? And, 
you know, from a recent conversation, he tried to do the same thing with Jean-Claude and Boley, you know, at a at a conference that happened, I, I want to believe, in Ghana. Uh, but it was somewhere in, in, in West Africa that they both attended. And Cambon was trying to make arguments against Jean-Claude and Boley's work. And one of the things that he did, which he always does, is it says that, you know, you don't have degrees in linguistics. Right. But I find that funny. When the main person who you, um, you know, recommended. And tried to sun and, and, and shame, uh, you know, against doctors Osei and uh, Issa and Faraji. He doesn't have a master's or a PhD in linguistics. And so, you know, I get into this conversation a lot and, and it just it just, you know, because people try to use that against me. Oh, you don't have uh, degrees in linguistics. What qualifies you to make linguistic arguments? If having degrees on the master's level and the PhD level, PhD level is the requirement in this community to to make linguistic arguments, then there's a lot of folks that people are using um, who don't have these masters and PhDs in linguistics. And so when we're talking about Theophilo Bingo, Theophilo Bingo is very well educated, a very knowledgeable brother in, in multiple disciplines. But his he has a master's in philosophy. He has another master's in education. And he has a master's in history. His PhD is in history, in humanities. He has postdoctorate certificates in studies in linguistics, in Egyptology and the like, in philosophy and the like. His degrees aren't in linguistics. If, if having a master's and a PhD is the requirement for making linguistic arguments, then we would have to totally dismiss Dr. Theophilo Obenga because he has he does not have those degrees. He has certificates. He has training. He has postdoc education, post master's education in it. I mean, he took courses. It's the same thing in which uh, Mboli did. Mboli is taking courses, not only in linguistics in Egyptology. And and uh, continued in self study. That's what Obinga did. The same thing with Shekanti Job. Shekanti Job has a BA in philosophy. He has two masters in chemistry, and his PhD is is either in history or social anthropology. He studied linguistics. Matter of fact, is Lilius Holmberger is one of his first teachers in linguistics. Singor was one of his, uh, uh, you know, classmates, I believe, in linguistics as well. But he doesn't have degrees. He has no masters, and or a PhD in linguistics. So we got to throw Diop away too according to the logic of some folks in this community. And then we have individuals like Christopher Arid, who uh, all his degrees are in history, but he makes linguistic arguments. So we got to throw uh, Christopher Arid in the trash as well. And I've studied under people who've gotten PhDs under uh, ARID, as part of that ARID school. And all the classes I take from them, even though we, we learn linguistic stuff, is history. They're all history. He teaches in the Department of History at UCLA. He doesn't teach in the linguistics department. But you're gonna argue that he's not a linguist? Because he doesn't have the, the master's or the PhD in linguistics. 
another individual, Dr. Roger Blinch. He's a, a, a major linguist who um, deals primarily with Niger, so-called Niger-Congo languages. But what is his master's and PhD in? Social anthropology. How does somebody from social anthropology be known as a linguist? Where do they do that at? We have to throw Roger Blinch out the out the window. Then, of course, we have good old Greenberg, Joseph H. Greenberg. Right. And I, and I love quoting this from Joseph Greenberg because people want to argue, you know, that because Brother Asar Imhotep does not have a master's or a Ph.D. in linguistics, that he can't make linguistic arguments and that you can't be considered a linguist. But then want to throw Joseph Greenberg into the picture. And, you know, in 1986, he wrote an article called on being a linguistic anthropologist. And in the text, he states from the foregoing account, it should also be clear that I did not have any coherent training in linguistics. I became an anthropologist by training, but to a large extent, I made myself into a linguist, a paradoxical Paradoxal as it may seem, the absence of an organized program in linguistics turned out, I believe, to be an intellectual advantage. It meant that I had no fixed emotional or intellectual commitment to the structural approach which dominated American linguistics during the earlier part of my career. At Columbia, from the first, I gave courses in such topics as language and culture and linguistic field methods. At Stanford, I participated actively in linguistics activities. When I arrived, it was only a program without an undergraduate major, but it has since developed into a full-fledged department with an undergraduate program. From the beginning, I was a member of the program and later a member of both anthropology and linguistic departments until my recent retirement. I owe an enormous debt of intellectual gratitude to my colleagues in linguistics. In spite of this, I have always felt that I was an anthropologist whose specialty was linguistics rather than a linguist who happened to be an anthropologist. Right? And so it's, see, what people don't understand is that while you can concentrate and get to degrees in linguistics, it is not necessary to do linguistic work. And people like myself who study Africana religion, culture, and, and anthropology and the like, we use linguistics as a tool to answer certain questions of history and psychology. And in all of these, where we talk about Greenberg, in in and Roger Blink in anthropology, you know Christopher Eric in history, Shekhan to Diop in history, or Theophilo Binga in history. These are all tools that we use to to answer uh, questions of, of history and social anthropology. It does not require a PhD or a master's, uh, although that would help. It is not a requirement. So we got to throw away all these individuals because they don't have uh, PhDs and masters in linguistics. Right. And so, you know, this is this is when appealing to authority goes wrong for a lot of folks. And I think in the, in the context of Cambone, he was more so specifically speaking of, you know, training in linguistics. That's why he couldn't put uh, Theophilo Binga as having a PhD or a master's in linguistics because he knows that uh, uh, Obinga doesn't have a master's or a PhD in linguistics or Egyptology but he has training in linguistics and that's the key thing here so we, we, we when somebody wants to appeal to authority you, you always want to look deeper into that and even still you know our good brother, uh, Dr. Cambone, is, is unlike the rest of everyone else, but his master's and his PhD are in linguistics. But it's, 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 it's a specific kind. And 
And, you know, what people don't understand is that a PhD is a research degree. It's a terminal research degree. It is it is there to demonstrate and to provide uh, an opportunity for someone to add knowledge to a particular field. Right. And, you know, the the concentration in the subject in which they talk is very narrow and is very specific. It is not a it's not a be all end all about, you know, the field itself It is a very narrow subject for which you get your degree in. And so this is the title of his master's degree uh, dissertation and is the recurrent sound correspondences of Akan and Yoruba and their significance for proto Benuqua East Volta Congo consonant one reconstruction. So. In this master's thesis, he is comparing the Akan in Yoruba basic vocabulary terms, but only doing the first consonant of the languages. And so while he's doing some comparative work, it is not an extensive, there's not a third language added to the analysis. You know, he includes some Proto Bantu and then he includes some reconstructions of Proto Akonic Bantu uh done by another linguist right but this would not qualify in terms of knowledge of reconstructing you know african languages and the like and defense like this is this is kind of very basic work which he did in this uh uh this master's thesis you know especially only dealing with one consonant and 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 the like and so uh you know, but unlike the rest of, you know, the, the folks, again, he has a master's in linguistics. So, you know, he, he has that, you know, on a lot of us. And then when you get to the Ph.D., his Ph.D. is titled Serial Verb Nominalization in the Con. You know, in, in, in other words, you know, the doubling of the verbs to to make them nouns. This is a typological analysis. This is not historical comparative linguistics. He's not reconstructing the language family. He's not establishing the relationship between uh, two or more, you know, languages. It was already by the time, you know, he did his master's thesis, there was no argument whether a Khan and Yoruba were related. So it's not like he established a relationship between Yoruba and a Khan. That was already assumed. And, and, and demonstrated in other ways in other texts. And in this one, this is just about serial verb nominalization in the Akan language. So although he has the PhD in linguistics, it's not in historical comparative linguistics. So even him having a degree in linguistics, he can't really fully use it to try to sun on folks uh, for not having a degree because his degree is very narrow in terms of the subject of his dissertation which all PhDs is a very narrow uh, subject. And so he's a specialist in verb nominalization in Akan, not in reconstructing African languages. And so, you know, we, we got to be careful even, even when they have the degrees in the subject. What is their degrees in? Like I believe Kwame Ose has uh again a a a background in linguistics but it may not be historical compared to linguistics you know he could just be teaching you know foreign language or literature or something like that but that would not qualify him to to speak about historical compared to linguistic work you know unless he just had that background now luckily for uh cambone he has a, a, a at least a little bit of background with with uh as demonstrated in his master's thesis so he's definitely familiar with historical comparative linguistics. But since, you know, he is not known for reconstructing and, and you know, any deep phonological work and semantics and, and like that, that is that is not his area of expertise. And so. So now we're going to go into the second critique. <laughs> and. This is on the God, uh, excuse me, on the name Menes. 
And so he spends a lot of time critiquing Ose, uh, Faraji, and Issa on the name Menes. And we're going to get into that in this next clip. So on page 75, you know, the, he's starting off this section of the conversation. Uh, a matter of fact, this is the beginning of his critique, his, his, of his real critique. Uh, and so, you know, on the previous page, he's just kind of introducing, saying that uh, the the Amen book is there's a lot wrong with it and it would take too much space to really kind of address everything. So I'm just going to highlight some of the the more serious issues that I have with the text. And then he just, you know, uh, starts his critique from there. So the first critique that he has about the text itself, uh, citing the text directly is what we have in front of us right now. So, uh, so he, so he's citing Ose, Issa, and Faraji in in the center paragraph here. So I'm going to read what they said, and then um, what Cambone says here. So he says the, so uh, Ose, Issa, and Faraji are making a claim that the historic founder of Egypt's first dynasty properly known as Narmer and sometimes given the name Menes, according to the reports of Herodotus and Manetho, actually carried the royal name, Heru, the soaring falcon of Amen. In fact, Herodotus and Manetho and Manetho's uh, rendering of the name of the founder of ancient Egyptian civilization as Menes provided a clue that his name carried the royal title of Amen. So uh, the authors are making the argument that the that Menes, the name Menes from the, uh, you know, the first dynasties or whatnot is the same name as the word Amen, right? So, and he's saying that in the text of Herodotus and Manetho that this is where you can find the word Menes in. And so they continue, Herodotus acquired this information from the prescribes of ancient Egypt that had for over 2,000 years recorded the names of their kings on papyrus like the historic Turin papyrus. All right. So Cambone says, apparently the authors did not deem it necessary to actually go and read the sources with which they claim to be familiar. The relevant quote from Herodotus in Greek and translation is as follows. So Cambon uh, cites the uh, text of Herodotus in the original Greek, and he provides a translation. And what you see in the black is the name that became Menes uh, as is translated in, excuse me, transliterated in Herodotus text. So, you know, so here, uh, for those those of you who can't read Greek, it's mina, you know, m i e na n. The, the the v looks like I mean the n looks like a v, and then ah, you know, you know the Greek alpha, you know, this is mina tone, you know, proton, you know, yada yada yada, right? So everywhere you see this bolded mina, and in here you see mini. That is the word that is being translated as menes. And so you, you see it um, here again. The priest told me that men was the first king of Egypt and that da 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 da, leave me aside. But men made the southern bend of it, which begins about 100 da 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 da. Now it's interesting that he's, he's getting upset at, I'm going to say getting upset. He's, he's providing a, a critique about the name menes. And that that's not what is written in the Herodotus text. He cites the Herodotus text and you see Mina and he highlights Mini, but he doesn't write Mina or Mini in the translation. So we can accuse him of doing the exact same thing. Why didn't he write Mina and Mini as it is actually written in the Herodotus text? So he continues, he says, this demonstrates a clear lack of academic rigor with regard to the authors 
apparently not having actually read the text to which they refer. And, you know, again, it's, it's one of those issues that, you know, so you had the first critique in which he, he said he, he gets at them for not citing Obinga when Obinga doesn't even do that work. And so now he is getting on them for the Menes because there's, you know, they don't put the, the Greek suffix, you know, in it and that is not present in Herodotus, right? But he does the exact same thing in this text. He doesn't, he doesn't write mena or menes. He writes men. If this is, uh, I have to go back and see if this is his actual translation or if it's somebody else's. But he didn't even catch it and in, in, in correct it if, if not, you know. So it looked like he was just looking for something to, to critique. And then he made these statements. And this is one of those critiques where I'm like, this was just a waste of time because it was an irrelevant critique. Because everyone knows that when you're speaking about Menes, there's different ways to say the name. It's just kind of a catch all, you know, like if we used to say, you know, uh, Memphis, we know that is Menefer, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be stated that it is it's, it's pronounced this way and da da da. It's just understood. And so, like, you know, this is just random. This is the Encyclopedia Britannica. So here's the entry under Menes, right? It says Menes, also spelled Mena, Mini, and Men. So it's understood that if you write Menes, it's referring to Mena, Mini, or Men. That's exactly what you see here. Mena, Mini. And men, no matter how you write it, we understand that it is the same person. It is the same entity. You provide no, you know, additional value in that critique. And then another another reason why it is a kind of a waste of time and kind of a ill an ill founded critique is because. The, the word menes is actually, remember, let's go back to their statements. In fact, Herodotus and Manetho, Manetho's rendering of the name of the founder of ancient Egyptian civilization as menes provided a clue that his name carried the royal title of Amen. So why didn't um, Cambone cite Manetho? The reason why he doesn't cite Manetho is because Manetho actually has the word menes in it. So I'm citing Manetho's text. This is fragment six. And I, and I highlighted it here for you. Again, for those who don't read Greek, I put the transliteration on top of the Greek here. This is menes. So when when Faraji and Ose and uh, Issa are, are making that statement, it's a kind of a catch. I was just understood that Menes has these different pronunciations. But if, if you were unfamiliar with this information, you know, it's, it's, it's disingenuous for Cambone to pick Herodotus and then make this argument, but not mention Manetho in his critique what cambone could have done if 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 it was even that serious of a critique in the first place is say that the word menace is is found in monitho but in herodotus is pronounced mina or mini but then that wouldn't it, it would show the 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 trivialness of the critique itself, because everyone in the academic world understands that you can say mina, mini, or menes or men. It doesn't matter. We all know who they're referring to, and so menes is not in Herodotus, but it is in Manetho. 
So, you know, you could have, again, you're not keeping your audience in mind. You can inform the audience that Menez is actually in Manito, but it is not that that variation of the word is not found in Herodotus. Could have said that and kept it moving. Right. And so this is why it's, it's, we, we have to go back and, and analyze all the critiques that are being made. And so uh, my third critique is I, I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that it does not sound like he is speaking to the authors of the text and he he is not trying to help them. He's not trying to, you know, enhance them in a way. It's it's more so, you know, I'm the linguist. I got the PhD and master's in linguistics. Y'all don't, y'all are not linguist. Y'all don't know what y'all talking about. Refer to Obinga. And, you know, and the whole article is basically uh Cambone trying to sun them. It, it's not like he's speaking amongst colleagues and that he's trying to help and inform them right and i believe this is a missed opportunity to not only help the authors especially since they gave you the book for their you know for help seeking help they're seeking your help and instead of uh you know getting back with them uh you know and and i've only heard one side of the story so it, it could be it, it, it could be something else. So and I'm putting that out there. But from my understanding, you know, they don't hear back from you at all. And they they have to hear back via someone sending them the article like seven or eight months later or so, uh, because, you know, uh, you you want to, you know, make your your critiques public to the world, um, you know, against the authors. You know, which brings up an issue of character, but that's another conversation for another day. But in in a situation like this, where you 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 already suspect that they are not linguists, and that their work, because remember, uh, well, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in the text in uh, Cambone's critique, you know, he he mentions that the, or at least he alludes to that the word amen you know being found among uh african languages in the modern day in deities that 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 fundamentally is sound right and if it is so you know why didn't you take the opportunity remember his critique is 21 pages long you could have spent you could have used three of those pages at least to show them the beginnings because as i titled this presentation often where there is smoke there is fire and i think that you know like this this author here is a good example of what i'm talking about and so this is dr modupe odioye who i've had on the program uh fairly recently and, you know, uh, uh, a linguist and theologian out of Nigeria who's, you know, over the past 50 years or so has been uh, demonstrating the relationship between the Yoruba language, Semitic, and ancient Egyptian. And one of his early texts, The Words and Meaning in Yoruba Religion, Linguistic Connections in Yoruba, Ancient Egyptian, and Semitic. And, you know, the, the beginning of the text, this was published in 1996, and this is actually the second edition of this text. The, the first text, I believe, was called, like, uh, Words and Meaning in Yoruba Religion. No, I mean, not Words and Meaning in Yoruba. Like, it's like Words in Yoruba Discourse or Religious Discourse or something like that. I forgot the exact uh, title. But he dedicates the book to Papa who he calls an incurable folk etymologist and his teacher, the venerable Archdeacon J. Olamide Lucas. And uh, Professor Lucas had written 
uh, a number of texts which he made the argument that there was a relationship between the uh, Yoruba language and the ancient Egyptian. And instead of, uh, how should I say, instead of, you know, again, he wasn't a linguist, uh, uh, Archdeacon Lucas. And there were some some things that, you know, he provided that he, you know, some things he got right. And but most of it, it was wrong. And, and so what people did is instead they dismissed the entire, uh, you know, his name became a byword. And they in, dismissed not only his work, but the entire thesis. Right. And. Um, was this i think on page 23 uh i think he let me see let me see if i want to read um this aspect of the text <laughs> um man, where's this aspect um i don't know if i want to read yeah so I, i'll just read this one paragraph I was going to read it um, so I don't have it on the screen, but, you, you know, hopefully you're just listening to what I'm saying. He says there was there has been one attempt at a genuinely philological approach by the Archdeacon J. Olamide Lucas in his religion of the Yorubas in 1948 and the Yoruba language, its structure and the relationship to other languages, 1964. The earlier book made Archdeacon Lucas first famous and then notorious and now a byword and a name. He had a hunch about the origin of many obscure Yoruba words, and in this he, he was right. He set about to demonstrate this origin, and in this he was frequently faulty. In fact, many people seem to believe that the philological approach has been uh, irretrievably discredited. My view is that the archdeacon is in the Yoruba philology what the Wright brothers were in the history of aviation. Beginners, not perfectors. And yet, without their efforts, we could not have arrived today in the age of the Concorde. Right. For those of you who remember the Concorde uh, airplane, that may be that may be too old school for some of y'all. But uh, and so in, instead of, you know, surly dismissing him and, you know, uh, trying to sun him in some papers, he acknowledges some aspects in which he got right but what he did instead was just do the work for him and and you kind of see that in uh, this text here uh words and meaning in yoruba religion right you just do it and and so now the reader has some uh sense of you know how to properly approach the situation and begin that and begin that process you don't get that in cambone's critique it's just it's just him venting right showing him you know uh what they what they got wrong but he doesn't show them how to do it right which is which is part of my critique is that he's not having a conversation with the authors of the text he is um he he he's venting to a friend in the barbershop in text form right so remember the central thesis of the book that the word amen that everyone ends their prayers with in uh um, in in the bible or in just in christianity in general uh is an ancient egyptian word and is related to the word uh amen which was the deity so you, you you've heard many people say that before that you know the 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 hebrews got the word amen from ancient uh egyptians and the god amen right like that like they stole it and and the like this is completely false uh you know so there's the there's the question of are they even the same word and my argument is, yes, they are the same word. However, 
the the almond that you find in the uh the hebrew language is uh inherited from proto-semitic it, it is not directly borrowed um, at least there's no evidence that is directly borrowed from the ancient egyptians because it's not it's not brought into the semitic languages in the form of a deity right which you would expect and so and not only that uh you know we can we can see it in the in these two languages here in arabic and hebrew and so you know with the semitic languages there are a uh their words are typically in a a triliteral consonant structure and the changing of the vowels and additional prefixes or suffixes you know expand the central meaning or theme of the root of the word right and so as Odioye has uh correctly identified uh so when you say an amen it has you know the the various translations of the various variations of the words you can see on the screen uh for example in arabic you know one was faithful you know and that's it you know the glottal stop so that that sign that you see in the in the very beginning is a is uh a, a, a sign for the glottal stop it's a sound that we don't necessarily necessarily have in english as a as a uh as a phone as a, as a phoneme so to speak uh, but it's present in certain words, like when you say, um, like when you drop certain sounds and you just kind of left with a, uh, like, you know, that's the, that's the glottal stop, uh, in English. So like when you say something, that's something instead of something, you know, there's, there's the glottal sound. So when you say, um, you know, it's like a amun, amuna, uh, I can't say the, you know, the glottal stop too, like, like someone natively. That, that has it as a phony but you can see these variations this this so you can see the themes on the right hand side so faithful secure trusted in believe again security safety and it it, it finds a reflex in the tree a kind of language as oman the state faith amen right the um, amen uh, how they say it. and then faithfulness in hebrew uh omin or amen right and then this is the the famous amen at the end of uh the, our prayers when we say verily or truly and then you know another variation on the vowels is faithfulness firmness fidelity trusted belief there's a common theme here in terms of safety security surety truity right and you you find this in the yoruba language as well except the nasal has been dropped a lot of the nasals in yoruba have uh since been dropped and they uh more often did not nasalize the preceding vowel so you have na uh, nasal vowels or nasalized vowels in in the yoruba uh, language and so you know you have this kind of split uh term so it, it comes from a word for rock right and from the notion of a rock you get safe and secure so you can see it in these forms where this mo here so hide and secure to keep safe to clear things from the floor to keep your mouth shut away from view safe keep safing purse bag run into hiding you see these variations here and so there's a common theme here and you know even in egyptian so now you kind of get a sense of where the the word in, in egyptian mean hide from or the hidden in terms of amen and this is what i mean they're the same word but they're not it, it is not a borrowing per se from the the ancient egyptian language in, in terms of the deity you know this this is uh uh you know diachronic you know uh relationship and so in in egyptian of course you have the mn root that i have bolded uh steadfast to remain to be established to endure amen abode residence a place to stay right and when the 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 nubians you know adopted the arabic language they called their 
their land, Balad El Aman, the land of safety and security. Uh, in Chui is Oman, the state. In the Ga language is Mang, town, country, state. And in Bibio is Iman, village group, right? And so, like, there's a wide semantic range that, you know, this root covers. And, and it has to deal with these roots coming from words for rocks and stone. And in Semitic, just like in ancient Egyptian, the B as in boy, the bilabial, you know, uh, plosive voice, uh, the, the voice bilabial plosive B, right? And then, you know, the, the M is in Mary. These sounds interchange. You can even see that in Tigre, you know, Amen. It been stone, right? And then other variations in, in Assyrian. And so the the glottal stop, and this actually corresponds by way of regular sound correspondences. And this is work that I've done myself. This glottal stop corresponds to the the reed glyph, the I or Y sound or J sound in uh, the ancient Egyptian. And so the B sharp, Mu, and Ebo, large rock, and Yoruba, Oromo, god of the rock, and, and, and Abiokuta, and Benin, Edo, Eben, royal scimitar, and a, and a, and a scimitar is a, a, a sword. And so you got to remember that uh, uh, rocks are turned into metal. And, and so in Chui is a reflex of that same. Uh, word and of course in Middle Egyptian you have menu quartz a semi precious stone, but you also have like the Ben Ben sacred stone and pyramidion etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But before I go to that, I'm gonna demonstrate here that this all of these words actually far far back in history derive from a a root for hand and 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 arm. And meaning to be firm, to grip, to hold. And it went in several semantic directions. So you had on the one hand, like the like the word for fist, like to hold, to close, to grip, to hold tight, to hold firmly. And and that which is, you know, hard, uh, firm or what like, like a fist, it became the word for rock. And the word for rock became the word for cover. You know, hide and in another semantic direction, safety and security. And from this idea of safety and security, that became the word for place, for village, for state, for city. On another hand, the action of the arm, meaning to create, to to pull things together, to tie, to weave, all came from that word. And so this is why you see so many MN and BN words in Egyptian and the Semitic and in Yoruba and and uh uh chiluba and all of that which we'll get into that how all of these that had the same consonant sequence or its equivalent its logical equivalent with all of these meanings because they come from the same root so in linguistics we call this paronymy and sometimes they would use that uh of course they're not the, the ancients weren't linguists, so they didn't know necessarily, but they believe that they come from the same roots. And then you'll see some kind of aspect of culture that is uh, built, you know, from this this understanding of MN and BN. And, and so, again, when you talk about the Ben Ben stone, uh, it's a sacred stone, an obelisk, a pyramidion. And then, you know, you have Ben Ben to point upwards, to be erect. In other words, to be hard, to be firm. Right. And so, you know, uh, uh, fellows, especially uh, sisters, especially, you know, when the when a brother is hard and firm, you know, the, the bin bin is 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 on point. Right. Is, is safety and security is firm and all that. And then, you know, other semantic extensions happen as a result because, of, you know, to be erect. And then, of course, it has to deal with sex to beget, to ejaculate. And then, you know, in Egyptian, there's an MN, uh, excuse me, there's an MB interchange and there's a BMW interchange. And notice that uh, we have men men to impregnate. So we have Ben Ben to beget, to ejaculate. 
Then we have men, men to impregnate, men, many begetter, nim, nimmy the begetter. There's a, I'm putting this all together because when you're doing the comparative work, especially with African languages with a consonant vowel, uh, consonant vowel, you know, word structure, often, you know, and as I argue that the, the Egyptian language is primarily a monosyllabic consonant vowel language. And then everything else is prefixes and suffixes that give it this particular shape that it has now. So you'll see the syllables switched. So that you see here, MN, MN, and it becomes NM, NM. And so that, remember that arm, hand becomes NM to shape the, or excuse me, this is the noun form, shape, form, the nature of something. Right? So we have, you know, this author, Samuel Gaesio Bing. Uh, PhD. He wrote a text called African. He's a linguist. And his one of his texts is called African Anthroponymy, an ethnopragmatic and morphophonological study of personal names in Akan and some African societies. And so, again, when you're reading the text, you know, he could have, uh, Cambon could have at least mentioned that Amen is actually a god among the Akan. He doesn't do that. And and so in this text, you know, we we have, for example, he gives the days of the week. And, you know, for those familiar with uh, the the Akan culture, you know, that uh, at least now that there's seven days of the week and each week is governed by a deity, excuse me, each day is governed by a deity and so on the if we see this column here on the left hand side is the name of the day of the week and then of course here's the english gloss so and then on the right hand side is the name of the deity right and so we have the day saturday uh Mimenida, and the akan god is amen right and we're told on page 17 that Amen, the word Amen means creation from the root men, meaning swallow or create. And he lets us know that A is a prefix and that Amen um, uh, means God of creation and satisfaction. Amen. And so normally you would see this name either written as men or ama, or ame, like when you say kwame, right? That ame is a variation of this word amen in kwame, right? So, so we know that the the god of of Saturday is the god amen, and it comes from a root meaning creation. And so when you go into the the uh, Egypt, the ancient Egyptian language, you find this very word, Amen, or Yemen, to create, to fashion. And there's a, a pattern that you, you, you see here, and even with the god Pata. So you have Pata, to create, to form. Then you have the god Pata, the god Pata. So it's telling you that the the real root of the the word um well it's possible that the you know unlike the seer hypothesis uh of obinga that given the actual language of ancient egyptian is is more than likely possible that the word amen is just a word for the creator right just like in a bbo bolt to create uh uh and creation and then obolt creator all right and so we we find this mn consonant sequence in the same in the collagen language men make pots make uh potter work with clay men clay this is going to become very important and so remember going back here 
that you know this is one of the reasons that when when i look at ancient egyptian words i'm always looking for their their syllable inverses and, and there's a whole lesson on why the syllable inverses exist in the ancient egyptian language because they also exist in the related african languages and that's because uh you know early early you know stage of the parent language in its development you had you know certain languages that had a certain uh sequence in terms of the monosyllabic roots and then you had another related group who had the reverse and they've been interacting over hundreds of thousands of years and they shared vocabulary with each other and so by the time we come into the modern age you know many of the the living languages still have the same word in the reverse in the language and so this is how i know that amen and kanum are the same deity just from a different dialectical group of people so matter of fact their symbols are the same so this is amen with the uh uh, ram's head and and green ram's head this is this is not canoe but this is canoe right and that word new means to build to construct to join to unite with hanimu builder and the one who unites so notice notice this semantic sequence that to build and to construct is the same in the minds of the ancient egyptians as to join to unite with to bring together so think about when you're actually like laying bricks and building a building you're bringing the bricks together or you're weaving a basket or you are molding clay and the like you're bringing components together to give it a shape so on one semantic direct, um, direction you have this this fundamental theme of unity and and bringing together and then you have on the other hand the idea of creating itself you know and sometimes they go into the the metaphor of giving birth and impregnating but you, you find the same consonant sequence in reverse in um among the collagen who who live in kenya so nam to take hold of to take care of to join to enfold to unite to seize to make things from clay it is the exact same word in a syllabic inverse that we find here in the first uh in in this first slide right and then we had chinam uh, chiname the molder with clay to join together then we have the the infinitive verb form kinam to mold with clay to join together so you see how these these uh these ideas work together and so this is important because if we're going to show the the reader how this is done you know uh, and we're going to make a complaint against somebody we have to show them you know how it is done and how they can make their argument successfully and so where there is smoke there is fire and so when we talk about this syllabic inverse we confirm it again with this word which means a herd which means to be united associated with uh, to be provided endowed with right and then we see that it's a syllabic inverse of men minet which is also a herd a group of animals so remember that word in kurundi kumana to be together to be neighbor to be a pair it's all from the same root so this is why i said that obinga is right but for the wrong reasons because he doesn't demonstrate that relationship he doesn't go deep into the semantics right and so we have a reflex of that same root you know mal meaning gather and again here we go these nasalized vowels because of the loss of the n uh in the second consonant position right and so we can see that these 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 words have a wide spectrum of meanings and forms due to reduplication you know prefixes and suffixes there's probably some you know 
some vowels that we don't see that indicate certain things in the ancient Egyptian language. There's 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 a lot to unpack and uncover. Right. And and here's a and here's more proof that the M N and N M consonant sequences uh, are inverses of each other because we have this hieroglyph on the left, which is Emenet, which means the West. Right. And then we have this variation here without the hawk on top of the, uh, you know, this T symbol here. Right. Um, and it can be pronounced either Emenet or Winnemet. So notice that they are the inverses. So this is further proof that Kanum and Amun are the same deity, just probably from different dialects or different, you know, uh, ethnic groups who settled along the Nile. Right. And and so uh, I put this slide here, not only for that piece of evidence, but uh, Ose, you know, makes the argument that, you know, on the you know, uh, the Narmer, uh, you know, one of the Narmer reliefs or his name, you know, you see the Falcon and that the, you know, it reads the soaring Falcon of Amun, you know, where they got that from, I have no idea. But the idea that the hawk might be associated with Amun may not be too far fetched. And I say that because, again, like when you read all of these you know, glyphs individually that make this composite, none of them, you know, read with the MN consonant sequence, right? Like this is either Shu or Ma'at uh, as the feather here. This is the T symbol and this is the S cloth. And this, I guess it's supposed to be like a variation of it. And so, you know, without the hawk, you, you still see the uh, Eminet and Wiminet or Winnemet, uh, right? But it's possible because this, this hawk could be uh, pronounced several ways. It can either be the word nature. It's also pronounced as her or where we get like Horus from. And it's possible that um, it, it may have been pronounced, at least for a minority group of people, as men or Amin. You know, and if if Chiluba in Central Africa is any, you know, indicator, because we had this word Chiminyi eagle hawk or to sell and then when in in the yoruba language we have you know uh awo which is a guinea file now i have a question mark here because you know uh and 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 we'll see why this w here is and awo uh is why this is here you know because this there's some regular correspondences between yoruba w and ancient egyptian m or w so, you know, maybe it could have just been a general, like there was an MN general word for bird. And that's why, you know, the hawk on the standard uh, or the hawk on the um, on this platform, I don't know how you would, you know, argue uh, this composition uh, may have been I'm in at one point, you know, who knows? Uh, so it, it's just a, a hypothesis at this moment. But just want to throw that out there again, where there's smoke, there's fire. And so, you know, what we're looking for is the regular series of correspondences between the languages. And this is what's missing from Ose and uh, Isa and Faraji's text. Right. And so, you know, he Cambone kind of hints at this throughout the text, but he doesn't demonstrate how like what it's supposed to look like. Right. And so, you know, I wanted to give the audience here. And so, and and to also in, in defense of Cambone, you know, he is correct when he's talking about, you know, just looking for MN consonant sequences and associating it with uh, reflexes in the ancient Egyptian language. You have to be able to demonstrate a regular sound meaning correspondences between the two languages. And this is exactly what we see here. Right. So we have Minette, thigh of a human, haunch of an animal, Chibelu, Chibelo, thigh in Chiluba, men to be ill, to be sick, Minette, malady, suffering in Chiluba, Bella, 
to be sick, suffering, mubedi, sick, patient. And so when L is followed by I, the L turns into D. And sometimes it's D when followed by I became, becomes J, uh, you know, or Z, like you pronounce it Z, but it's like Beji. That's how you pronounce it, right? And so this word for singer, this word for men, men to move about, to shift, to impregnate, etc. We see in Chiluba, Buela. And so you, you see the uh, the rounding of the B sound in the front of the front vowel here and to enter, to penetrate, to introduce, engage in, undertake, indulge in, impregnate, penetrate, abound in, invade, fill, to lie down for the sun, etc. And it is this root here that gives us the word for West. So just like in ancient Egyptian, that men, the men, meaning right hand, Western, right side, West side comes from this root meaning to move about, to enter, to shift. And, and it's proven by the Chiluba language, uh, you know, that, that, that still maintains that semantic relationship in the roots or whatnot, right? So uh, so that's just one variation. So you can see my sound correspondences on the right-hand side. So this is what's missing from Ose, et cetera's work. Or I should say et al., I'll say et al. I'll just say I'll say et al uh, for the rest of this conversation, right? And you know, I always introduce this concept called trans uh, transitivity, and you know, the formula is if a equals b and b equals c, then a equals c, right? So we go into the next one. So we've already established that the m n in ancient Egyptian corresponds to b l in the uh, Chiluba language. But that same consonant sequence, BL, also corresponds to WN in ancient Egyptian, as well as the W, uh, and this is the nasalized of Vular trill. It's a, it's a type of R sound, this, this entry right here. So, and this interchanges with N in Egyptian, right? So we... We have these forms, you know, this is not surprising because as I've demonstrated a thousand times, ancient Egyptian M and B and F corresponds to W internally. So it would make sense that the BL uh, consonant sequence in Chiluba would not only correspond to MN, but to WN and W. Uh, the nasalized of Ular Trill, the R sound here, right? Based on regular sound meaning correspondences. And so, of course, you can pause the video and go through each one of these carefully to see if I'm wrong or not in, in terms of my uh, semantic and uh, phonetic associations, right? But that WN sound also corresponds to KL in Chiluba, as we can see here. And this KL uh, consonant sequence can also correspond to the CHER and like NETCHER and, uh, and the HER in the, the uh, like in Horus. And so that's why the word NETCHER and the word Horus, excuse me, and HER for Horus are represented by the same symbol. And so this this informs us that there is at minimum two different ethnic groups, uh, two different languages and two different ethnic groups that that lived along the Nile uh, in ancient Egypt. And both of their uh, languages contributed to uh, the written form in which we are familiar with now. Right. So, you know, that axiom is very important if A equals B and B equals C then A equals C, right? So keep that in mind. So we're going to deal with Yoruba real quick so you can see these forms here. E win and win nature and character. And so why am I focused on the WN instead of just MN? Because when we're looking for these other forms, I'm just trying to give you all the different ways in which that consonant sequence manifests itself internally in ancient Egyptian and what they correspond with to in other African languages. 
And so we can see the same consonant sequence like a win, pillar, column is a wall, pillar, column in the Yoruba language. You know, and even the ancient Egyptian W, they, them, there corresponds to Yoruba, I will, they, them, but they maintain the N, whereas uh, the ancient Egyptian had dropped the N in this form, right? And then again, we have Enim, skin of a man, of hide of an animal. It corresponds to Awo, skin and leather in the Yoruba language. And so the N is, is well, this consonant sequence is reversed. But the, you know, the, the one form still exists in, in the Yoruba language. And so like these are the kinds of things that we have to do if we're going to make an argument that uh, we can find, for example, Amin of ancient Egypt in, in West Africa. You have to do these sound correspondences and establish these sound laws. So this is what, uh, you know, we have here. And so this is, this is very informative because it's telling us that, for example, you have among the Yoruba, Iwin, the ancestors, ghost spirits, Awon, spirit. As reflexes in the Ingos language, won ancestors, the living dead shades, and won the demigod in charge of the dead. And so we have a, a title of Osiris, Ewin. And what I argue is that this same title, Ewin, is the, the same name as the word Amen. So you have one group where the Amen becomes the supreme deity, but then you have another group where they use that term just as an epithet or a, descri a description or a title of Osiris. But in, in other parts of Africa, it just becomes the general word for uh, spirit, for God or ancestors. But this uh, this one among the Ga, for example, who lives also in Ghana, it tells you in, in this text, religion and medicine of the Ga people, a one, an Iwin, a one, wall, which you see here, is anything that can work but not be seen and includes the smaller beings of specialized and limited activity associated with medicines and magic. And so that's important that can work or do things to make things happen to create, right? But not be seen because they're, they're plain words. It's paronymy here. And this is, and so it's just a general word for, for a deity or for God etc in the in the languages so you have even in the ancient egyptian when in beings gods that's what an amen is he went ancestors skull spirits i want spirit i the hidden conceal i will secret so when you talk about a babala will you know uh father of secrets father of the mysteries right you're calling them an amen priest and they're a priest of amen in ancient Egyptian, we just call them in among the Yoruba Baba Lawa. Right? And so, this Iwa, Uwa, being, existence, life, manner of being, when to be, to exist, to live. Right? Like these, these are all related forms in variations of the root men, quote unquote, uh, that becomes Amen that has all these other different associations. So even in, so, you know, to, to prove that men is the same as when, you know, I, I provide this and I, and I cross reference it with the Yoruba. Right. And so y'all can, y'all can look at this and note that, you know, the Yoruba often drops the the comparative r on and the nasal in the second consonant position in many of its comparative words and it may show up as a lower high tone and the vowel it really just depends and so you know we just don't have time to go through it all just yet but this is this is the kind of work that osei and et al should have been doing to to make the argument uh that they made right and so this allows us because remember that cambone's argument uh, excuse me his his master's thesis was on the comparison between yoruba and akan right 
and so we'll, we'll find the same things uh amongst the the account so on the left hand side is a con and on the egyptian side uh is in the middle and then of course the sound uh correspondences uh or at least graphing correspondences you'll find here on the right hand side so whether it's min or nim they all correspond and that's why we can say that amen to create to fashion to creator amen is the same as amen amongst the uh the the akan because we've established the sound meaning correspondences where there's an in in akan it is either zero meaning it, it it's been dropped or it corresponds to in in ancient egyptian where there's an m in uh, a con or a w it corresponds to m or w in ancient egyptian and so we have demonstrated fundamentally that the ultimate theme of the origin of the word amen in terms of the relationship between amen and in uh, amongst the akan in ancient egypt and the word amen in the semitic languages is sound it's just that they had to demonstrate and we can go deeper and more and and, and get even more rigorous in in our approach it, it would it would be the same because i've already done this work and so even amongst the dogon like this is this is why amongst the dogon so they call it ama among the dogon right at least the dogon in mali and and in other dialects you'll see it as amen right and they both have the same ram symbolism both in terms of sex or androgynous and the amen birth eight living principles the ogdoad as we would say uh oh excuse me the the hemenu the the eight and then and then amen gave birth to the eight ancestors of humanity this, one of the symbols or the elements of Amun is the sun in the form of Amun Ra, and then Amma is light, and then their body has an eye, and Amma has an eye. You have to read the pale fox uh, to to really get, you know, the details of of this uh, dealing with Amma. But again, that Amma of the Dogon is the same as the Amma amongst the Akan, which is uh, is also known as Amin uh, or Inyame. Or in Yamene, in in other parts of, of of Ghana, and so you know the pale fox informs us of a very critical thing when it comes to Ama, and 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 I demonstrate in one of my texts that the the word ultimately comes from a word for hand and fist, but it says uh, Ama's clavicle resembles the form of the U, for Ama holds life therefore millet it is white for ama is all white the word ama means to hold firmly to embrace strongly and keep in the same place one calls ama's name all day long one calls him when the day begins he is hogan therefore the chief of the scheme hogan of wasters ama arranges the scheme of things after he had wasted ama one is space 14 fold to pronounce the name of Amma, Amen, is to preserve all space. The name Amma is preservation and safe keeping of all things. So again, we go back to what we're talking about here. As I argue, the word Amen ultimately comes from a root meaning a hand. And it went in two different semantic directions and they're all they are all brought together as a result of paranimi. And so you have to be firm, therefore to grip, to hold, to preserve something. And from that hold and that grip and that uh, this this idea of keeping in the safe place in the same place, you know, uh, holding firmly like a rock, it becomes a word for stone and rock. And this becomes cover and hide and security and safety. Remember, the name of Amma is the preservation and safekeeping of things. Right. And that idea of safekeeping becomes the 
the the the fundamental thing behind a a state uh government a a village uh, or what which is why you get oman in among the akan the word meaning state right and then on the other hand with the arm in 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 hand you know the the action of the arm in hand is to uh create to make something to produce to bring something together and this is how all of this comes together and again all of this could have been done in three or four pages out of the 21 pages of the critique and then given this as a foundation for them to work with and you know i dealt with a lot of this in my 2021 text chiluba maweja yoruba orisha and ancient egyptian ak an exploratory etymological study which you can get you know from my website at sarmhotep.com and uh you know that's kind of the focus and i think i'm going to do a full book on amen like just dedicate an entire text to amen right and so we can get to to the bottom of this but like this is what you do when when you are you know interested in the subject and you know you really want to educate uh the public and it's not just a critique just to try to sun someone right like you really have their their best interests in mind not only in terms of the authors but in terms of the audience and so as we always say here demonstration beats conversation and so these are some of the, the the major critiques that I had of the critique uh, of Cambone, you know, against uh, their work. So as I stated before, the linguistic arguments are fundamentally uh, they're they're sound. They're like the same issues I, I've had. I, I've told them, you know, over ten years ago, uh, close to fifteen years ago. You know when i when i came across the book for the first time so um but uh, you know they haven't changed anything and uh oh and, and i see the the message from um brother omawale uh, excuse me uh brother uh any herrick calfani says please don't forget to play the Omawali video. So I'm going to play that real quick and, you know, remind y'all to support our good brother in the movement and uh, which he's doing. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to go there and then um, play. Oh, let me unshare because I know for a fact uh, that I did not click that one feature which says to share the system audio. So let's try that again. Got it. And so get it right the first time. So boom, let's go there. So boom. We sometimes talk about world hunger as if it is a scourge that all of us want to see abolished. That was the first sentence in a paper titled The Benefits of World Hunger that was put out by the UN that has now been removed from their website. My name is Omawali Africa and I'm a documentary filmmaker here in North Carolina to talk to you all today about my upcoming project, the fight for food sovereignty in the South. We took on this new project for two reasons. One, to expose the fact that black America is losing land at an unprecedented rate. And two, to inspire a new generation to come back South and reclaim the land. Without land, we cannot feed ourselves. And if we cannot feed ourselves, it's impossible to free ourselves. Land, power, and independence are inextricably linked. In my new documentary, Hannibal, the fight for food sovereignty in the South, will be exploring these topics and much more with a range of experts, scholars, and those in the know. Hit the link below and follow the campaign online at hashtag from freedom to famine. Already. And so, uh, you know, hopefully y'all were able to hear the sound this time and so again want to thank our good brother omawali africa uh, for coming on the program i appreciate each and every one of you 
um, when I came back, it looked like it was 117 comments. So, of course, I'm not going to be able to go through that and uh, view it all. So um, what I'm going to do is end the conversation here. And so is not to drag the video out any much longer. So hopefully, you know, you something to think about and to uh, go deeper and to, you know, not not simply just accept a critique because it is a critique, uh, you know, from somebody, um, you know, uh, of note and of stature, but that you look at the critique itself and to make sure that it is sound. And I know, of course, everyone isn't skilled enough to do that in every instance, but, you know, it, it just goes to show that even a critique is not the end all be all. Like they can be right on some things and wrong on others in their critique. So it is it is up for us, the reader, to do our due diligence and and in and examine both the original claim and the critique with the same uh critical analysis uh and, and sense of duty to get to the truth and so i appreciate each and every one of y'all i don't know where the after party is going to be i know brother omawali on his channel you know his pre-recorded interview is going to start at five and you know hopefully i can check out what any of y'all do on the night you know, in these YouTube streets. But thank each and every one of you. Uh, I wish y'all a good weekend. And until next time, peace.